basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. To me, basic SEAL training was a lifetime of challenges crammed into six months. Finally, in SEAL training, there's a bell, a brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to wake up at 5 o'clock. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to be in the freezing cold swims. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. Eddie, how are you, brother? Good, my friend. How are you? Yeah, fantastic, mate. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show without any like hesitancy or anything. Um, you like, I, I can see you're a busy man. Try to be. <laughs> Before we go on, uh, just a big thank you to a mutual friend of ours, Dave Radband, former uh, parachute regiment here in the UK and, and the um, Special Forces Support Group who suggested we get in touch. So, Dave, if you're watching, big thank you, mate. And uh, Absolutely. Eddie, thank yeah. You, Dave. Eddie, we got a lot of um, young people on my podcast, a lot of aspiring military people. My whole thing is I just tell them the truth, the good and the bad, the political. Maybe they don't want to hear it. I don't know. They seem, right. to, they seem to subscribe. So let's just take it from your your beginning and feel free to say whatever you want or, or not as the case may be um shall we start with the fact you speak french how how did that come around uh whew. i took french in high school and i really did it just because i thought i could talk to the lady sexy that was really the the main reason when i was uh, i think i was a freshman in high school <laughs> uh did not realize the headache that came with it but i mean the school system over here they think that teaching one to 10 or your colors actually helps with the conversation and it doesn't at all. But when I got into the military, there was an, uh, an opening to do French. So I did two, three, three month segments and that was probably five or six years ago. Went over to France a few times. And I mean, it still takes a while, a few days to like get into the conversation where I can order food and be polite and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm nowhere near hundred percent fluent, but, uh, but it's fun to learn. I mean, it was, it was, not in it when your head's about to explode from the information because you just feel like you're drinking from the fire hose. But um, it, it's cool to know that, you know, the base is there. And if I want to build on that, I can. So yeah, it's a special thing, isn't it? Especially for us Brits and Americans, because we because everyone speaks our language and they make it so hard to learn when you go abroad because they just want to speak to you in English. Um, right. It's a nice little thing. I'll speak a bit of Spanish and um, it's, it, it's a nice string to your bow, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It, it, when you're trying to learn, like when I go over there, I'll try to like speak French and they're like, this guy's just not, he's taking too long. So I'll need to like think of the word and then speak it. They're, they just jump into English. I'm like, whoa, I'm trying to learn here. <laughs> yeah. Hard not to get angry, isn't it? That's what I yeah, do. right. <laughs> yeah. I worked in a supermarket in Norway and I really tried my hardest to learn Norwegian and the customers, as soon as they heard you trying to speak, they just assumed you were English and they start. So in the end, I just pretended I, I didn't understand them I, as if I was maybe Central European or something. I was like, <laughs> and they're like, oh, sorry, what? I thought it's you were English. <laughs> did, you, did you have to speak that uh, in your Navy career? Uh, no, I did no... No, none, none. Just went to the school. It was actually when I got custody of my children. I really could. I had to miss a deployment. Um, 
and before I moved over to a training billet because of my children. And then I just had, I had time. So I was like, send me to some schools and French would just happen to be it. So. Mm. Now, Eddie, you have a unique um, distinction, if that's the right word, in that you were in the core before you were in the seals. Right. Can you tell yes. us about that? Ah, <laughs> um, well, it all started when I was, I mean, when I was in high school, I swam. Uh, and then I had a good friend and I was, and I was set on the Navy. I wanted to be a SEAL. I mean, that was pretty much, or some kind of spec ops of some sort. So I had a buddy that was a great ahead of me that I swam with and he went to the Marines uh, and we did boot camp in Paris Island down in South Carolina. So I went to his, his family asked, would you like to go to his graduation? I was like, absolutely. I'd love to go see that. Cause I was really interested in the military. I really just didn't know where I was going. I mean, I was concerning the mall. I, I just didn't know just trying to gather information. So went down there and I just, I mean, honestly seeing the obstacle course and people boxing each other and just the, um, the, the pride, the discipline and just the crispness of it all. I just like, man, I, I, I want to do this. So I was like, all right, I'm got back. I pretty much signed up for the Marines. Uh, and then when I got there, I mean, it was awesome. Don't get me wrong. I, I needed that. I needed that discipline. I needed to mature. Uh, I would not change a thing. But once I was in, I was like, I want something more. And it's not to say that the Marine Corps does not have more. They do. Uh, but at the time, Force Recon was not, from my understanding, it wasn't financed well. So they weren't a part of like uh, SOCOM, Special Operations Command, to receive, you know, you know, bulks of money for training, all that stuff. So they just didn't have that. So I was like, I'm going, I'm just going to do my original dream. And that was the SEALs. And I, you know, so the day I got out, I mean, my, the Navy recruiters were waiting I had one day break because I had to drug test you and do your processing. And then I was right back in the Navy and I went straight ahead for the, for buds. Yeah. So. Cause I saw somebody chatting to you online somewhere and they were, they were saying it was like, they thought you'd had to join the Navy to join the SEALs. And I'm thinking, but the, the Marines is the Navy, right? I mean, we, we're part of the Navy in the UK, right? Right. It used to be, if you were the Marines, you could do, I don't know exactly what the program was, you could jump over to do BUDS, and if you did not make it, they would just kick you back to whatever unit you came from, but that's not the case anymore. So when I came in, I thought that was the case. That was not the case, because, you know, we, if you have, like, vacation days left over, you can take what we call terminal leave. I'm not sure if you guys say the same thing. So I, yeah. I had, like, three months left, and I just did nothing. I was like, can I go? Like, I'll, I will give you my terminal leave. Like, I want to start my process. I just want to... I want to get this process going, but I had to wait until I was completely out after my four year mark and then jumped over, but there was no cross cross decking or anything. Couldn't do any of that stuff. Not anymore. I heard you could, but not when I was going through. And um, what about in the Marine Corps? You see all these drill instructors just shouting. It looks like they shout all the time. And that would be correct. <laughs> and, I'm guessing it probably wasn't like that in the seals, although it may be at buds. It was, uh, buds, buds. It was, there wasn't like the mentality of like, I'm going to break you down a hundred percent like that. I mean, honestly, the way I look at it, the Marine Corps, I mean, they, they, they kind of stripped you down and they were kind of working on the intangibles, like your honor, your courage, be a good person, be decent. You know what I'm saying? Which honestly is if we look around the world right now, I think a lot of people need it. Um, and, I, and, I, and I believe it starts in the home, you know, so, but I think they did a great job of that. I'm so proud of that. I think they do an amazing job at that. Uh, but buds, they still, I mean, they still ring you, but it's, they got some serious physical, act, physical activity and they're, the ultimate goal is, we're, Hey, it's combat. That's our goal is to be ready for combat wherever it is, whatever time of day, whatever. I mean, you know, the deal that's, that was their mission. But of course you, you know, you still have to start with the basics and, all that good stuff. Like, can you just take the misery of not, uh, not you know, the cold, the sleepless nights, the um, sometimes not getting the, the meal that you wanted and just mind, mind, messing with your mind nonstop. That's where they went. And then they just kind of build you up with uh, skills, you know, land warfare, diving, demolitions, uh, firearms, that kind of stuff. So wow. there is a difference. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I, I say a lot to people is that the, every service, does a different role. So it's not like this service is better than this one. They're all unique, right? And I know, I know you know this. I agree thing. with you. 
I agree what, with you. What a lot of people would want me to ask is, I'm guessing from a physical perspective, how much harder is SEALs training than Marines training? Um, one thing I will definitely say, I mean, BUDS was definitely physically harder because you got to think you're getting, when you're going to a boot camp, you're getting guys mostly straight out of high school, straight out of high school, younger, not, not saying they all, I mean, they all are. You got some in your mid twenties and stuff like that, or some like pushing thirties, like, Hey, I probably need to do this. But most of your young kids, you're just, it's a younger generation, but BUDS, I mean, you still have some guys that come out of high school, but they have a school. So they're a little bit more mature, um, mature to do it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little different, man. It, it is definitely different, but it's not a, um, the, my, like for me personally, my mindset at Marine Corps boot camp day one was a hundred percent different than it was day one at Bud's. Mm -hmm. I was more mature. I had four years military service. I knew things were a game. I was prepared for it. I knew it was going to suck. Uh, but at the same time, I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, the deal of camaraderie and, and teamwork and, and the pride that you get from that. I fed off of it. I mean, I fed off of it. And, and to be quite honest, when guys would quit, I'd be like, all right, bye-bye. You're not, this wasn't made for you. And it made me feel stronger. Like he, I'm better than him. And it's not to say that I was, but that was my mindset. Like, okay, I, I would need that to, you know, put in the gas tank. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's see how many more we can beat. Let's see how many more we can beat. So it, it, it was, it was a good time. I learned so much, but it's that mind. It is that mindset. <laughs> So did you deploy when you were in the Marines? I did not. I did not deploy, and that was a big turnoff for me. Um, after boot camp, I went to School of Infantry, uh, which is in North Carolina. It's Camp Geiger, which is attached to Camp Lejeune. Um, and they, you, know, you go through your School of Infantry, which I think was like two or three months, and then at the end, they give you your orders. They just kind of go down the line tell, telling you where you're going. And all the P's, my last name is Penny with a P. So all the P's went to Quantico, Virginia. And I was like, and that's where security, security forces training was. So I was like, I'm not security forces. And they're like, no, you're going to go train officers. And I remember thinking to myself is how am I going to go train officers when I, I need training? I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, are you kidding me? I've been in the military for like six, seven months. Uh, but you just, you know, you're a, you're just a target. You're a dummy. You're just, you play war games all the time. But in that uh, the, the first year I was at that duty station, I was in the field, and I'm not saying consecutively, I mean, if I mean Monday through Friday, like 7 to 5 p.m. or whatever, uh, I was in the field 315 days of that first year. I learned a lot. Learned a lot about basic infantry skills. It was, it was insane. So wow. it, it sucked at the time, but looking back, of course, I'm thankful. <laughs> yeah, I bet. It's probably kept, kept you alive, I'm guessing. Yes, I, I'm, I'm a, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And how is it, because some of us are old enough to remember the Clint Eastwood film, Heartbreak Ridge. Ah, such a, that's a classic. Yeah. Was it, was it anything like that uh, when you're in uh, Carolina? Um, you, like, you've got, like, you have your formation runs. Um, to be honest, no one was tough as Clint Eastwood. No one was as tough as him. Period. But you still have your stuff. You guys need to still instill discipline in people because you still have your troublemakers. As I like to call the ten percent of just like just don't get it. Like just be the you know be an asset, not a, not a liability. Uh, but I mean that was definitely a little bit more Hollywood. There's no like live fire shooting by your feet or stuff like that. And but there is drills like training exercises, stuff like that. Absolutely, definitely. Mm -hmm. But not a hundred percent. And the, the Marines, it's San, San Diego and Paris Island. Is that right? The two training camps? That is correct. Uh, I, I believe it's Mississippi River. You know, if you're on the west, San Diego. If you're on the east, Paris Island. Yeah. Is there any kind of um, folklore about which school's better or is that not a, not a thing? <sighs> of course. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> we call, you know, the guys in San Diego, the Hollywood Marines, and then Paris Island, Scott, it's uh infamous sand fleas and all that stuff so it's just i mean i'm sure it's i, I can't really speak for san diego i didn't go uh, i'm sure it sucks equally as much so uh but what i understand is the airport's very close to the boot camp so you would see flights taking off and i can imagine that would play on the mental psyche pretty good so there's that <laughs> and is that this 
Is that the same for the, the seal camp, for the buds? Is, is there two locations? Just one. And Just one. That, that's east, that's um, west coast, isn't it? San, yes. San Diego as well. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Nice cold water out there. Yeah, because one of your your one of your colleagues was telling me it's it's cold. <laughs> it's, it's it's extremely cold. You just you would think California sun, just the way the ocean currents is bringing all the uh, water down from the north. It's it's not warm at all. Oh my god! Yeah. It, <laughs> when you're young, though, you just do these things, don't you? You know, you just do these things. Yeah, you, you do. I mean, it, it comes down to, like I've mentioned before, mindset. And, and I'll probably say it about 15 more times during this uh, during this podcast. But I, I believe that that's it. I mean, I thought about it. I've been asked a thousand questions from a thousand different people about this. Uh, what do you, you know, what do you put? What do you think the main thing is? And I believe it's your mind. Uh, you go in there with a mindset like, this is my mission. I will complete it. There is no excuses because guys will forget. I mean, we, um, we've all done it. I've done it. Uh, we come up with excuses and we try to tell ourselves, oh, this isn't for you. You would be better off. Why did we do this? It was a good shot. Let's, let's do something else. That's not, you signed up for a reason. You, you're there for a reason. And it doesn't matter how cold the water is. It doesn't matter how much sleep you lose. You, you got, I mean, it, people have done it before. You know, there's, there's hundreds and thousands of people that did it before you. But you're no different. You're still human. We're made the same. You know what I mean? So it's just like, there's no excuse. <laughs> And uh, I just, that was, that was it. That was my mindset. Like there, I, I would never think about quitting. I mean, there was, I think it buds, like they would say like, Hey, warm dinner, warm shower, cozy up, you know, in your little bed with your cup, with your uh, comforter and your pillows. And I would feel like, man, that would be so nice. Okay. Snap out of it. We're back into it. We're back into it. They kind of like take you to that trance, but uh, you know, you just boom, you're right back at it. Like, Nope, I will have that in a week after hell week is over or when this, whatever section of training is over, that's what I will get it. And I will, and I will be wearing that insignia that, that, um, that I work for. Has there ever been any suicides at that place? You know, guys that, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I really don't know. Um, there wasn't when I was there, um, the class before me or two before me, there was a death from a drowning, um, in the pool. And I don't know all the details on that, so I'm not going to speak on it. Um, but no, I, I don't. I'm with the history. Uh, I don't know. I really, I really, have, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, I just um, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, the military attracts a whole range of people, and of course, all our minds are in different places. Mm -hmm. and, and the the stress or the upset of failing or thinking you're going right. to fail must. Yeah, I'm. I'm I'm just wondering if it's ever pushed anybody over the edge. I'm sure it's taken people down the, uh, the, the path of death, you know, where they're drinking, popping pills, doing stupid things. I, I, I would imagine. I, I mean, just the, way, the feeling of quitting. I mean, yeah, not, not a good feeling. So when you see um, seals in the field, they're all really thick set. You know, not, it's, it, it's not just that they obviously work out but they look like thick. I mean, you, you, they look like big, big guys to start with, you know, I, my background, the Marines, you get all different sizes, you know, you get some mm. guy, some guy like six foot seven, some, we had guys that were like maybe five foot four. They technically, they were too, right. they were too small to join, but the guy in the recruiting office just went going on, on, on you go son and turned a blind <laughs> eye because they were so keen. Right. Um, but when you look at um, the seals, or certainly the pictures I've seen, they they all look like big big guys. Is that is that a swimming thing or? Uh, like if you're looking at Bud's pictures where they're running down the down the beach, I'm assuming that's where you're going with this. I mean, you're you're working out. The, I mean, you working out is crazy. I mean, they, they are ripped dudes. Uh, it's not to say that they're all like bulky dudes. You know, photos can be deceiving. Like that dude's huge and he's really like, you know, 150 or something, or, or I mean, 140. Uh, but, but like afterwards, uh, when guys kind of get to, I mean, you still have your smaller guys, you, you do, because we still need our climbers. We need the small dudes to do certain jobs. Um, bigger guys, obviously, breaching, carrying the big guns, whatever it is. I mean, everyone's got their place, but you do see, like when I went from, you know, Buds to Team Two, 
to development group, you do see guys kind of getting bigger because they kind of like, you know, they've got the experience and guys are like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lift and I'm going to be just lift weights or I'm going to be like, I'm going to just do fighting. I'm going to be big into the rock climbing. I like to run and swim. Some guys like to do it all. Uh, so it's kind of, when, when you get to that certain point, it's on you. It's, it's your responsibility. No one's telling you, you have to go do this. You have to go do this. You know, you have to go do it. So you go do it without being told. Uh, so it's, it's kind of what you want to do, but there's, there's guys that are quick suckers that are climbing up the side of ships, uh, that I could not do because uh, this body is not made for that. Uh, just like theirs isn't made for bulldozing through a, a door sometimes. So, um, we complement each other. Well, again, it's the team, right? It's the team. You got to have all those different assets. If, if everyone's the same kind of takes away from, uh, being, you know, multidimensional. So. Was there ever any racism? Did you see all these guys coming together? That's funny. No, uh, no. I, you know, that it's it's funny that we're you know we're seeing all the all the stuff and the hype on on the news. Is there's never been oh he's Hispanic oh he's white oh he's black whatever it is. If you're a good person, you're a good person. If you're not, you're a turd, and, and no one likes you. Uh, that that's it. I mean, it's based off of how you treat people. Uh, now have I seen it? I, I have seen it. I went to a, um, I went to an NFL draft and this was when I was done deploying. It was towards the last couple of years and I was going to go on stage to announce, uh, my favorite football team for the NFL draft in New York city. I, I had the privilege of going, uh, it was an honor and there was, it was myself and another seal who happened to be black. And I was, because it was the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, which was my team at the time, I, uh, it was just known that I was going to do the, um, the announcing, but if it was the Chicago bears, he was going to do it, which I was totally cool with. I was like, you can have every other team. If it's the Bengals, I want to do the announcing of who they just picked up. So it was the Bengals, And this officer comes over me, over to me and he goes, Eddie, we can't let you go announce. I go, why is that? And he goes, uh, we're trying to get more black individuals into the, into the community. And, and I understand, I understand, I understand because of, we got to work around the world. You, you know, you got people to blend in. I, I get that piece, but um, I just had this internal feeling like this is not right. This is bull crap because we, we're not, we don't judge people. I, I thought we were all green or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So yes, of course there's racism and, and it's, and it is political. Um, and it's from what I understand, it's getting worse. Um, and this is speaking to buddies, you know, after a couple of years after I got out, like how's it looking at it? Like very political, very political, very political because as wars die down as you know people want to engage in rules and policies and because they have nothing better to do but when there's when combat was going on and we had two fronts we we're working on as you guys know very well uh the mission is the mission is the mission you know getting rid of the bad guys on this earth that's the mission so the politics were coming into it but as the wars were dying down politics were going up and idiotic things like that so yes there is little things, but I'm not saying there's not like, oh, he's he's Hispanic, he can't hang out with us. Oh, here comes the white guy. There's no, I didn't see any of that stuff. Mm. Is there joking around? Yes, we'd have black individuals like you are the whitest black dude I've ever seen. It, it just, it, you know, there's that joking camaraderie. I love the dude like a brother. He loves me like a brother, and that was it. Their their race wasn't. I didn't see black. I didn't see Hispanic or yellow or brown or whatever it is. If you know, if you're a jerk, you're a jerk. That's it. I don't care what you, what color you are. We had this interesting, well, I say we didn't have it, but though there, there was an interesting phenomena in our training. And that was one of our commando tests. Um, we had to jump off the high diving board in basically your equipment. So your fighting order and a, we, they used to give us an old Enfield rifle and you hit the water so hard, you immediately sink five or six feet below the surface and then you've got to try and swim up and it, it's a lot harder than it sounds. You swim all the way down the pool, all the way back. You've got to hand off your equipment to a guy on the side without touching the side. Right. And, it, and it's mm -hmm. really hard. Right. Um, and then you've got to swim away. So you, you still haven't touched the bottom or the sides yet. And you've got to tread water for five minutes. I, I've got real low body fat, so I struggled with this. It took me, I think it took me 
three times to pass it. I was just thinking the water, I, you know, <laughs> if you can't breathe, you can't breathe, right? Right, right. But it was kind of a, a, a recognizing that the black guys had more trouble with this test Correct. Than, 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 than the rest. And is that, is, how is that in, in SEALs, which is predominantly a water-based mm -hmm. uh, career? Does that affect the, the, you know, the, the percentage of people that join? It, it does. Uh, we lost a lot of individuals, uh, black individuals in my, we called it pool comp. Or excuse me, we called it, uh, I think it was water week, where you're, you got to do where your hands are tied, your legs are tied, you're bobbing, you got to swim while you're tied up, that kind of stuff. And I had a really good buddy, a black friend, and he, the dude was massive. He's like 6'4", not an ounce of body fat. And, and we would go to the pool, we'd work on it, and um, the instructors would, you know, they, after, after work tutoring for this guy, because he, he was a phenomenal performer, uh, just his body fat was so low. I'm, I'm guessing, I'm not a, you know, whatever, I don't know the physiology or whatever, or the physics behind it all, but um, he would just sink. He had a real hard time just floating. and. And I, you know, what's the answer or what I, I don't, I really don't know. But I mean, I, I would just like to think that like, you know, he was b being saved by God, like, Hey, this isn't your path. This isn't for you. And he ended up going to, um, he did EOD. He passed it with flying colors. He kicked butt. He deployed. He was, I mean, he's an awesome individual, but maybe that was just his route. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, it, it was definitely, um, Definitely a common thing. A lot of uh, black individuals would be would be going right there for the uh, the pool week because of that very reason. So yeah, they, I can't explain it. I don't know. <laughs> well, they say they 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 say these guys have a higher a, a, a heavier bone density, but lower mm -hmm. lo, lower body fat, which is probably not a good combination if if you know in a sport where you want to freaking look awesome. That's for sure. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I, but there's but there's also individuals that make it. So I don't know, you know, I, I it might I, I have no clue. I mean, it's just it's one of those things, you know. Yeah, I mean, just they, like David like Bogan in a basketball team, it's mostly blacks dominating the sport because that's just that's their thing. I don't have an answer for that one either. Didn't David Goggins do um, buds twice? I'm not sure about or, him. Um, I didn't. Hell, I, I never hell, week twice. I'm not sure. I've never operated with him or I just, all I know of him is he likes to run. <laughs> <laughs> I never, never operated with him, never worked with him. I really don't, I really don't know. Never mm. met him. So. Yeah. He's, I think I heard him talking about it. He's just, you know, he's just explaining that mindset of refuse to accept a no. <laughs> and, and, and he, and he's a hundred percent right. He is a hundred percent right. Mm. I agree with him. So how's the diving phase? Was that something, Eddie, had you done that before you joined the SEALs? No, that was my first time, my first exposure to that. Um, you know, you start with obviously learning the dive rigs and the first one was scuba. So your open circuits, it's in a pool uh, and they do the, you know, just learning the basics, going up and down the pool, trying to maintain your, um, uh, neutral buoyancy trying to stay at the same depth as you swim so you're not like going up and down uh which can totally just mess up your oxygen consumption or your air consumption and all that good stuff and then wear you out and then you move to nighttime stuff and then you move to open water and then you go to the closed circuit and you just kind of do the process all over again but that is some fun stuff but i will tell you this nighttime diving under a ship is one of the scariest things i've ever done <laughs> it looks cool. I've learned that anything in the military, if it looks super cool, it, it one kind of sucks or it's scary as hell. <laughs> I mean, jumping out of a plane at, you know, 30,000 feet, it's, it's pretty scary. You got all this stuff on you. You're like, I don't even know. I mean, how does this even work? You know, you got straps everywhere. And same thing when you're underwater under a ship. Like if something goes wrong, like I'm done. There's suctions underneath ships. So I, they're just going to pull off my regulator from my mouth. Like, what do I do? It's just, it's, it's funny now, <laughs> not then. Yeah, so, but yeah, it's cool. When you're diving, I mean, when I was wetsuit diving, I, I found it so easy and I felt so confident with it. 
when mm. I swap when I swapped to a dry suit, uh, for a, it was a, for an an, uh, an exp I went on an expedition to Antarctica and we did some diving down. Oh there. wow! It was a really great experience. But I tell you what, because you got two different et, um, air reservoirs, so you got your buoyancy uh -huh. packet and then you've got your actual dry suit itself. I, I could never get like work in between the two. Some people said you shouldn't, you should just use the air in, inside your jacket and forget your, right. your, your BCD, your buoyancy vest. Um, and I even perforated my eardrum because I rocketed to the surface like, mm. about twice, which is just really bad drills in diving. Right, right. Um, but you can really feel out of control down. I, I felt at times just really uncomfortable with the dry suit diving you know mm -hmm. yeah it, fortunately i never had to do the dry suit uh diving i mean obviously i have the dry suits for ship attacks or stuff like that but never i mean because when we do our stuff we don't go deep when we're doing you know our combat diving we don't go deep mm -hmm. so yeah that's interesting yeah i think and to, I hopefully think, no one's in antarctica <laughs> yeah well even the uk is so cold you couldn't be that you yeah. have such a thick wetsuit to stay down mm -hmm. for any length of time that dries we mostly die with dry suits over here you know mm -hmm. um, yeah so how many guys did you start buds with eddie i want to say around 200 and it was originally 150 and i believe we had like 50 55 roll-ins from guys that were injured or failed an event and they said, hey, this guy has potential, let's keep him here. And they would roll him back to our class. So I believe 200-ish around there. And we finished original ones, originals, no rollbacks. I wanna say we're like in the mid 20s. But I think our graduating class was like 40 or 50, I believe, I think. Oh, don't that's don't quote me on that one. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a small amount of people considering how many stuff it is. It was just like douche, douche, douche. Guys, just dropping. Do you, Do you get to know all of those? I I know it's there. I know it's always changing, but roughly, do you get to kind of know all two hundred guys, or or do you just kind of know your your team? Uh, no, yeah, you really just your boat crew. I mean, there's so many guys, and then you know, you kind of got to watch who you're hanging around and not that people are bad, but you want to be around the, I found that the people that are sarcastic were funny and could have fun with it and it kind of made you laugh, kind of took your mind off of the task at hand or the pain and misery that you were suffering at the time. So I kind of like, you know, gravitated towards those individuals and I, you know, tried to, you know, do it as well for them by cracking jokes and all that stuff. So I, I really didn't, I wouldn't say there's clicks, but I just kind of would be, I, I like to hang around the positivity. I didn't want to be around like, man, this sucks, dude. I wonder how many people are going to, you know, drop. I wonder if I'm going to drop. Do you think you will? Like, I don't, I don't want that. I don't need that crap. Get away from me. I'm going to dominate this. Whatever we're, we're doing, that's, that's all there is to it. And I, those are the people I tried to hang out with. And, um, but towards the end, I'd say probably like in, uh, in the first phase after Hell Week, you start, you know, you start developing those relationships and, you know, like, hey, I mean, you can kind of tell minus, you know, barring um, injuries or something weird, uh, like, hey, this guy's going to be here. Or like, hey, this guy's, you know, he's got like two strikes, one more, he's, he's gone. So, uh, but you start, but by the end of Buds, yes, you, you're pretty tight with everybody. So. This is a funny thing, right? Us military guys, I don't know what it is, but we always breathe through one side of our... I, this is all my all my military guests. We all breathe. It, am I doing that? <laughs> it, do you think it's all the fights? Hey, rock on. Is it all the fights we've got into, do you think? Like we've all probably, I know this nose has been broken a couple times. And I think, who knows? Probably. I do it all the time with my Marine guests. <laughs> none of them realize they do it. Um, sorry, I just digress there, but... <laughs> No, you're, you're good, dude. That's hilarious. <laughs> but let's, I got now I'm all self conscious. Like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> so let's talk about your um, deployments, if we may, because you've been, from what I gather, you've been, you, you spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Is that correct? Uh, yes, did uh, seven deployments. And they were all to either Iraq, Afghanistan, and I had one to the Horn of Africa. 
mm-hmm. uh, a, a short one. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, you know, you, you, you finally get there that, you know, my first, you know, go back to my first deployment is, you, you know, you had all this training and this is your dream. This is your dream. And, and that first round for me, it wasn't gunfire. It was a, it was a indirect fire. I think it was like a mortar and it came in and it was probably hit like a hundred yards away from, from, away from me. And in that split second, I'm like, okay, reality just hit like just bam. Just like that, and you get the EBGBs, and you're like, oh my gosh, like, okay, this is the real, okay, we're at the show, here we are. Um, but then again, obviously, the more, you know, you're around that stuff, not that it's a great thing, but after being in multiple gunfights and all that good stuff, and houses blown up on you, near you, whatever it is, you know, you kind of get, uh, you get callous to it, I guess, and it's, it's really not that much of a big deal, but that, I'll never forget that first time that mortar hit, and I was like, whole like jumping in for cover like in like one of those barriers um that they had or those bunkers they had over there but then it's a it, then you kind of realize like it just doesn't work that way like it's gonna <laughs> you can't stop it you just hear that quick little whistle and there it is so but it I man what an experience what an experience uh developed a lot of amazing relationship uh learned a lot about people i learned I think the biggest thing that I learned out of my deployments is how evil people can be. And the reason why I say that it's not a great thing, no, but I, it's prepared me for my life. I'm like, okay, I, I, you know, not to say I don't trust anyone, but Hey man, there's, there's evil, evil intentions out there and they don't care. They know they don't regard life. Like we're, we're like, Oh man, that's like, like, let's help this person. Like they, they just don't, a lot of them don't, I'm not saying all of them, but the bad guys, I'm sure you've witnessed this yourself. They just don't care. They just don't look at it that way. They're, it's, you know, it's, the programs are messed up. So in my eyes, you know, if you're yeah. willing to do some evil things, you're, you're jacked up. You went to Iraq first. Correct. My, uh, yes, my first deployment was Iraq. Second deployment, I did two months in Afghanistan. And then we did, I did four, then went straight over to Iraq for another, for uh, four months. And then I would be lying to you if I told you what deployment I did next, but I did Iraq, Afghanistan. I think it was more in Iraq than Afghanistan. I think it was like four and two or might've been three and three. I'm not sure, but yeah, seven total. And then one was the one of Africa, but learned a lot. It was, it was a good time. It was good fun. Just being uh, that, that pride of just ridding evil of this earth. I was, I was definitely happy about that and just, working with my boys, doing what I love, uh, just, you know, to be honest, ridden evil. I don't like evil people. I don't like bad people. Can we ask what, what you were doing down there in Africa? Are you allowed to say? Uh, just, it was a high value target operation and that's about it. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what sort of extremes of firefights have you been involved in? Uh, I, I think pretty much all of it, uh, uh, you know, been ambushed, uh, been engaged with, hand, you know, hand to hand. I mean, you, you name it. I mean, I, it's not like Saving Private Ryan style or some of these movies where it's like nonstop craziness. No, but uh, mo- most of the firefights were pretty quick. We kind of knew what we were, we were going with, um, knew where the bad guys were, uh, took them out accordingly and moved on. It's not to say that we were always, um, and then we've always, and then we've, I've been in, in situations where the night sky looks like there's uh, shooting stars everywhere because there's nothing but RPGs coming over your head and you're laying down on the ground wishing you were a piece of paper. So uh, every target's different. Uh, I've had houses blown up on me uh, a couple times or been in right near the house. Uh, I've lost many friends from gunfire explosions. Uh, so yeah, I, I would, I would say I haven't seen it all. I don't think anyone ever sees it all. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm here. I'm thankful. Lost some damn good friends, uh, which I hate, but, uh, they knew the sacrifice that they were doing and they wouldn't have had it any other way. That was, that was their heart. That was their passion mm-hmm. was fighting for this country. And again, getting rid of evil from this earth. So. Eddie, what, what made you leave, um, leave the forces? Uh, I was, I think it was, I was at my 16 year mark, 15, 15 and a half, 16 year mark. And I was going through a divorce and I had three children at the time. Uh, I won somehow, 
uh, one custody of my children and I got 100% uh, custody. So I was, I was dad. So I couldn't, um, I couldn't deploy. Uh, and the ages were one daughter, my oldest daughter, she was 10. Youngest daughter was five, I believe. And then my son was eight months old. So here's this baby and I'm, I know nothing but deploying and going over to bad guy land and now I'm taking care of these kids. Um, at one, one of them still in diapers. So talk about, oh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had to stop deploying my, my command that I was with at development group. They were totally understanding. They were super cool. They're like, what do you need? And I was like, honestly, I need some time to learn how to be a father. Uh, and, I, and I mean, I, I'll be the first to admit, um, I was very self-centered. I cared about myself because uh, I believed in the country. I believed in my job. I believed in what we were doing, especially with the stuff that was going on in the, uh, the climate in the world. You know, terrorism was very rampant. So I believed in it, but still at that time, I was definitely neglecting my kids. Uh, and I see that now. One second, I got to, can you see me? I can see you. Okay, sorry, I got a call that kind of kicked it off. So I, um, but so I had to like kind of figure out how to be a father and they gave me the time I needed and here we are. So I, I had to stop deploying, but I only had a few years left. So I took a training bill to do my last, um, my last few years. During that time, I got my degree in security management, did the French, this is the time I did the French uh, and just stayed with my kids. I started my company, Contingent Group, and then rest is history. Mm. Did you um, experience any challenges in that resettlement? Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, that was, that was the hardest time of my life. Uh, not being with the boys, not deploying, not doing my passion, what I've trained for years and years and years to get to with all the blood, sweat and tears, losing your friends right next to you. Uh, so having to step away from that. And I, I mean, I had the choice, like I had the choice of like, you know, you know, having the kid's mother be like take the children, but it wasn't, it wasn't the right move. I was supposed to take those kids. So I did. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was very hard. It was very frustrating. I had no clue what I was doing. Um, there was a, um, there was some pill popping to sleep. I couldn't sleep at night. I would drink a lot of red wine <laughs> uh, to get to sleep. I, it was, it was probably the roughest time of my life. Um, and I'm, I'm past that, thank God. But that, that first year or two, um, it, it took me out. I was, it was like an outer body experience. I have much respect for single parents. Um, and, you know, I, I hear my friends sometimes, oh, I got to I gotta babysit the kids for this weekend. Or I got to stay with the kid. I'm like, you better enjoy that time. You better enjoy that time and lead and be that father or that mother. So my view has totally changed uh, with, with uh, the events that I went through. But um, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. And we've got a lot of our brothers and sisters struggling now in, in I, I'm guessing, well, I'm not guessing. I, I, I'm sure, it's, I know it's the same in America's UK. We've got a suicide epidemic. Um, what, mm -hmm. what advice to anyone listening now who might be struggling, what would you say to them, Eddie? If you could say, I don't know, let's just say five, five philosophies that have really helped you. Or, or um, I wouldn't, I, I would, you know, um, if you're honestly, the biggest thing that helped me was diving into the Bible and finding Jesus Christ. That was my, my personal, that was, that was my saving grace. That's what I did. Uh, that's what I was led to do. And I fought it. I fought it hard. Um, and it, it just didn't work that way. So I'm like, that's, that gets me right there, man. That, that was my saving grace personally uh being around that you know having my accountability people people that actually like held me accountable like hey how you doing what's going on people letting people into my personal space which i kind of mentioned at the very beginning of this uh podcast you know that was hard for me to do i still have a hard time with it but i have my select few individuals that i allow in and they they're like hey what's going on are you you connecting with god what's how's the family life what's how's you know how's the drinking how's how's this and how's that yeah uh, you got to do that and you got to reach out. You can't, you know, and, and a lot of us do this. I think this is a bit, one of the biggest problem. And I, and I am guilty of this is um, I kept to myself. I didn't reach out. I just thought I could hand it to myself. Like I could do it myself. And then I had a moment where, you know, I had a pistol in my hand 
uh, which not a lot of people know about. Uh, but I have a book coming out here soon that's going to go into depth in a lot of the stuff. Um, and, and, you know, I just kind of had this outer body where I'm like looking down on my body with my head blown up, open and my kids coming in and seeing this. And, you know, the, I didn't have the gun to my head or anything. I put the pistol down. I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? I had to get out of the house. I went to the gym and worked out, which has been my therapy is working out nonstop and fighting and lifting weights. That, that's, that's what I need is you, you just got to find what makes you happy. What is it? As long as it's not a good thing. And if you don't have that, you got to find it and you got to reach out to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, we all struggle. I, I don't think there's a person and if they, and if they say, no, nah, I'm fine. I, I think you're a liar. I, I really do. I think there, there's something you're struggling with. Uh, and a lot of people, and especially in our community, they don't want to come out with it because I'm a man, I'm tough, I, I, I'm good. I went through training, I did this, I, you know, I killed bad guys for a living. Dude, you're a human being, all right? That's it. We, we all got to fight some stuff on the in, inside. We all have it. Uh, so, yeah, I, reach out, reach out. And it's a hard thing to do. I understand. I feel with it. I empathize with you. But uh, that, that's it. You got to make that first step. Don't worry about don't worry about step two, three, and four. Worry about the first step. Reach out, get some help, and I and I and I'm sure and I know the military has things set up now. I, I think they were kind of lacking in the last you know 20 years, but they you know they're they're picking up what's going down now with all the suicides because we have the same same issue here. Uh, you know, organizations and military they're starting to step up and and do the right thing and kind of address those situations. Yeah reach out it's tough take, taking action isn't it you've you, you know unless you take action it, it's nothing's going to change you're 100 right you know it, it goes with everything we see it everywhere people talk 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 it's that implementation that becomes the problem and you said fighting are you are you into any particular sort of discipline uh i, I i'm big into the muay thai I'm really just big into hitting things. <laughs> Why not? Uh, I do Muay Thai. Yeah, right. <laughs> I do Muay Thai a couple times a week. Uh, about to go back, start doing jujitsu. Uh, do MMA things. You know, heavy bag work. A lot of you know, a lot of workouts like fighting workouts, and obviously my standard work, weight lift, my weight training, which I've been doing for years. But just it makes me feel better. I like it. Uh, there was a time where I didn't want to do any of it. Uh, so yeah, it's just. It's just my thing. It makes me happy. When you were, were uh, with the development group, do you do you get taught unarmed combat, or is that all a bit of a myth? Yes. When I was there, we had a thing called Fight Club, um, and it was pretty much if you're a new guy, you had to go. Uh, after a couple of deployments, you could decide to go or not go. Uh, so you would have to go, and it was I think it was like Mondays. Excuse me, Monday and Wednesdays with jujitsu. Tuesday was like combative with your gear, like your weapons, blades, stuff like that. Thursdays was Muay Thai and Friday was straight up boxing. Uh, so yeah, you did, we did all that stuff and that was every morning for two hours. Uh, so you get, you know, it's, it was good. I didn't like it at the time because it would mess up with my uh, weightlifting, which I hated, but looking back, I wish I would have stuck with it and not take this, this long break. Uh, so I've been getting back into the last few months, which I'm very appreciative of. But uh, yeah, we we did. They were they they brought in UFC fighters, professional fighters, guys that are you know use stuff. Um, just you know, if you go to a restaurant, what can you use as a weapon? Because you you all, I mean, if you're in a, if you're in something like that where you need to fight for your life, you want the easiest way to defend yourself possible. You don't want to go like, oh, I just use my hands all the time. You know what I mean? It, that doesn't work with a dude with a blade all the time or somebody with a pistol, as we know. So mm -hmm. and. With um, development group, do you, or, or dev group, is it shortened to, do you get to do a lot of stuff that the other teams don't, or is it just more, more testing the new equipment? Um, the, the funding is much better. The funding is definitely much better. So you get to do and go to different schools that you would not to in the, um, into the other teams just because of funding. So a lot of civilian schools that you could go to, uh, like, learn to drive race cars or be a captain of a ship or, you know, certain driving schools, um, lock picking schools. You, I mean, you name it. And as long as it fits the job or it could be used overseas, which it's a, that's a lot. Um, then, you know, you just, you got to send it up the chain of command. 
get the ex get the acceptance and then you're you know you set up your trip wow it was, it was a good time it was fun it, it was learned a lot learned a lot very blessed to have experienced that love the men uh, and women that were there uh, our supporting staff was freaking insane so it was it was awesome it was the best experience yeah wow it's it it's one of those things isn't it it's it's good to have done something like that in your life it's Yes, I, very, very privileged. Uh, and, you know, it's that's where you look back and you're like, this is why I don't quit right there. That, yeah. That's why. And let's talk about um, your company now. It's a kind of security come consultancy business. Uh, yeah. So Contingent Group started out as executive protection and how it kind of started. A good friend of mine, actually my bud's roommate, uh, and him and I were the only two roommates that stayed together the whole class. Everybody lost their roommate somewhere along the lines. We were the only two that stayed together the whole two months. So very good friend of mine. Um, we, he, he worked, he got out after a couple of years. Um, I think he did like six, eight years around there, did a couple deployments, got out and he was doing security for a, a very wealthy family slash organization and he's like, hey, we're looking for contractors. You want to do this on the side? And at this time, I was not deploying anymore. I was doing my coordinator position, training guys up for buds. And I was like, sure, man. I, I, could, I could use the extra money. I was taking a military uh, pay cut just by leaving my command. So I was like, absolutely. So kind of saw, uh, saw what it looked like, what it was. And I was like, man, I can, make a, I can make a business out of this. So I did. And it started out just being... Um, contractors being executive protection i'm like wait a second i can do i can do background checks too okay i can do that as well okay i can i'm, I'm a pretty smart guy when it comes to evils I'm, I'm i'm like my brain works as the bad guy because just being in that unconventional realm for so long with small unit tactics i i, I can think like a bad guy very well so you know i can take i can look at a house or a, an office building and be like all right this is your weak spot this is your weak spot so then assessments were like, all right, we can do assessments. All right, we can do red cells, like penetrate. We can track money. We can do pretty much anything and everything that reveal. We, I kind of like to say we develop the security around you. Like, we give you your security atmosphere. So, a lot of it's corporate now. We do mostly international work, but we do stuff here in the States uh, time to time for individuals. So, it's just kind of morphed into this, um, like, you know, one week we're, we're, we're on this next week. We're like, I'm like, wow, we're on this now. So it's just, it's awesome. And, and really it's just, you know, pulling from uh, the network of, of men and women that I've know and validate from, you know, I've been overseas with, I know what can do. And then of course they've got their, uh, some government ties and stuff like that. And just, it's a big network and we pull in the right people for the right job. So that's, you know, it doesn't matter what language, where we, what country we need to be in. It's um, we just, we make it happen. Mm -hmm. they must be quite proud to have guys guys like you working you know protecting them yeah we, we, we'd like to think so and, and the, the bad thing about this is well, bad and good is you know sometimes they're like why am i paying these guys for this stuff and 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 the, the truth is if you see us go to work work that means we kind of messed up maybe around like we didn't do a good route plan we didn't do a right assessment so it's kind of like mitigating things so nothing does happen so if nothing happens and it's extremely boring, then we did our job. You know, that obviously doesn't go that way all the time, but, uh, you know, that's, that's how it is. Have you done any sort of close protection stuff with, with the, the celebrities and that type of work? Um, I've done, I wouldn't say celebrities per se. I would say ones that are kind of uh, movie producers, I, I, I'm not big on celebrities. I'm not saying all celebrities are bad, but uh, I will say that most of them are. <laughs> and I, 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 I kind of want, I don't want my guys or myself, you know, we're at, at parties at, until three or 4 a.m. when there's just people doing drugs, alcohol, stupidity starting. Like, I, I just don't want to be in that atmosphere. It doesn't say we won't do it depending on what the mission or what's, what's happening. That, that's not to say that, but to be like, hey, I'm going to follow around celebrity x while they live their life I, I would probably turn that down we, we turned down a lot of jobs based off of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. yeah got you. we're more into like kind of the corporate you know people that are running legitimate businesses and they got a lot of moving parts setting up vehicles they need you know 
make sure you know they get the right crime stats of where they're going all that they're deciding to develop here we want to make sure we know about that area before they start wasting pumping money into it and you know just so they don't walk into like hey by the way this is owned by the cartel oh okay that sucks <laughs> So. Uh, yeah, that that will be my next question. Have, have has anyone ever tried to compromise you? Um, I would not. I mean, I think we've been followed before, but I wouldn't. I mean, earlier on in the in, in stages, we had to deal with um, getting people out of certain situations, and that was more demonstrations, stuff like that, like where they would uh, like Cannes Film Festival. That was one of them. They just started, I think it was the taxi driver started like rioting and demonstrating. They went because everyone was using Uber. That was kind of like the Uber thing, you know, yeah. that was going on or private drivers are like, no taxis, taxis, taxis. So, uh, I mean, we'd have to find ways to get our client to our vehicle away from that safely. So, you know, we, we have to do stuff like that, um, you know, here and there, which you just, you kind of can't help. You can't help by a flash mob that pops up real fast uh, and have, don't have time to switch airports or whatever. Uh, natural disasters had to deal with that down in Mexico, right? When we have clients coming in, huge earthquakes and just jacks up things. We have to do um, make decisions and move things around. Uh, but and then there's been some other instances that we just you know we don't we don't talk a lot about clients, as I'm sure you can understand. But uh, yeah, but not not huge things like wow, we almost got gunned down. We haven't had that, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, well, that that means you're doing your job right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Why well, we like to use armored vehicles sometimes too. <laughs> and the the uh, the unafraid um, the unafraid brand is that your brand? Yes, it is. Uh, that's that's a new thing that I'm kind of uh, just started. It's my personal thing. It has nothing to do with Contingent Group. Um, it's a you know just on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever guys are like. And I, I like to put up motivation stuff. It's it's always I I read it. Uh, from people, my mentors, and they don't even know that they're my mentor. I just kind of like follow them and they inspire me. So I, you know, people were kind of reach out like, Hey, thank you for posting this. Like, thank you. I needed this today. So I just kind of like, Hey, my, you know, and, and the unafraid came, I was, I was driving and I was hearing a song and it's, and I just heard, they said, I am not afraid. And it just, it just hit me. I'm like, you're right. I'm not afraid. No matter what it is, talking to someone like you on this podcast, going to try a new thing, um, not afraid to go humble myself in front of somebody like in, in, in while sparring with them because it's going to make me better. Uh, I'm not afraid to be a parent and do the right thing. I'm not afraid to discipline my children. I'm not afraid to say you are wrong. This is how we do things the right way. And this is the proper way. I'm not afraid to just do new things and try new things and do the right thing. Uh, I'm just not afraid of it. You know, do I question sometimes? Uh, like, uh, do do we, are we afraid? <laughs> yes, but that that's just kind of it. It's my it's my word. I just I love it. And and then you know we got the heart and the brain there. You know you got to have that heart, that passion, and then that mindset. That's what that uh, that brain is there. It's that mindset. It's all about that mindset. I believe it a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, Jesus said, "Do not be afraid," didn't he? He sure did. He sure did. Yeah. He's a. Is a, uh, a if you ever dodgy in life, just look at what Jesus said, and it and it's that will sort you right out. Oh yeah, he, yeah. You, you, you just every time you read his passages, his words, you just you're finding something new every time. It's like I didn't see this the last three times I read it, and here you are hitting me with it. I get that's why they call it the Book of Life. Yeah, Eddie, you've it's been beautiful. absolutely fantastic, brother. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate it. Oh no, it's my 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 pleasure, and and I thank you as well on behalf of um, our our viewers at home and, and listeners. Um, what? Just one question: Are you are you East Coast originally? It's, East Coast, what? It, it, like w w where were you brought up? Were you brought up in like? Oh, uh, I was brought up in Cincinnati, Ohio, so the Midwest. Ah, oh my God! I would yeah. have thought I I I thought you had like a sort of. Not a New York accent, obviously. It's not that that. Who who knows what accent? I've been pretty much living everywhere, so who knows? <laughs> who knows what's going on over here? <laughs> it's my own language. What? Yeah, I want to say my doings and my goings. I always get my girlfriend rips on me all the time for that stuff. I just say hey, it's it's me. You, well, in the forces, you can get a bit of a mixed accent, can't you? Because you yeah. you're associating with people with that have quite a quite a strong influence on your life. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Where, where can people find you if they want to book your security services? That you can go to uh, contingentgroup.com or you can go to, uh, we have an Instagram, which is just at contingent group. Uh, you can look us up on LinkedIn. I mean, we're all over just contingent group. We're pretty much that across the board on everything. So that's the best way to do it. And, but if you need to email or you want to, you have concerns, info at contingentgroup.com. And you have uh, Instagram. Is that for the pub public to follow you or? Yes. So our contingent group, we put out free safety tips for people. A lot of, a lot of every, everyone seems to like it. They're like, man, I never thought about that. And we get guys jumping in with other ideas, which is awesome because I believe that more minds are better than just one uh, or just a small group. Uh, so you get people, you know, throwing in their two cents on their security or safety that has worked for them. So we, you know, we use it because it's, you know, it's a community. Uh, so that's straight up. And then I have my personal one where I do some different safety stuff or that I'll kind of like share uh, so either one, you're going to, you're going to find contingent group. So. Excellent. Well, look after yourself and, uh, I really hope we get a chance as well. Let's, let's speak again in the future. That'll be, see, see how Absolutely. it's all going. Be safe, my friend. And thank you for your service. You are very welcome, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, Eddie. Thank you. Take it easy, my friend. You too. You too. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.